All right, folks, today we're going to hit book 12, The Sirens, Scylla, and Charybdis. This is the last um, set of chapters that Odysseus narrates in his own voice. Uh, this is going to bring his story up to when he gets deposited on Calypso's island and then spends seven years trapped there. Um, so it's going to bring us sort of back up to date, and we're going to end this chapter back in King Alcinous's palace, where Odysseus is hoping um, to get home. Uh, from there to Ithaca, that King Alcinous has already promised to give him a ship and, and take him there. So last time uh, we were in the Land of the Dead, we've been following the story on this map. Um, remember that Odysseus started at Troy, he fought the Sicones, lost some men, ended up at the Land of the Lotus Eaters, then to the Cyclops, where he lost some more men, um, then to Aeolus' island, almost got home, but then that bag of wind was opened by his crew, ended up back there. The Lestragones ate a bunch of his men, and he lost all of his ships but his one. He ended up on the island of Circe. He went to the land of the dead to meet with Tiresias, where he found out the prophecy that Tiresias gives him, which is, if his men do not eat the cattle of the sun god, he will be able to get home. But if his men do eat the cattle of the sun god, then it's going to be years before he gets home, and there's going to be trouble in his house, and things are going to be pretty terrible. And... Uh, that is the prophecy that he receives from um, Tiresias. And then, of course, he meets all these other people who are dead, King Agamemnon and Achilles and Hercules, and uh, he sees Sisyphus and Tantalus. And, you know, like there's all kinds of illusions wrapped in there, and we did some classwork on that last class. So today he is setting out from the land of the dead. Uh, his first um, leg of the journey is to stop back at Circe's house and uh, to bury Elpinor, who fell off the roof, he made a promise that he would do that. And so that's where we're going to start. And then um, we'll move on from there. But today we're going to meet some um, interesting adversaries, the Sirens and Scylla and Charybdis. Um, these should be familiar to a, a Greek audience, um, not necessarily to you, but to a Greek audience, because Jason and the Argonauts had to face off against the Sirens. Uh, and thankfully for them, they had um, Orpheus on board, and he could play a song that rivaled the Siren songs and thereby sort of drowned them out and gave the men something to focus on, whereas Odysseus does not have Orpheus on board. And so he's going to have to find a way to solve that problem without the magic uh, musician that you see in Jason and the Argonauts. Scylla and Charybdis are mentioned in Jason and the Argonauts, um, but they aren't, aren't a major part. Um, Jason and the Argonauts sort of have this choice between the crashing rocks, these rocks that like smash together like, I don't know, a mini golf course that would crush their ship um, if they can't putt through the, the hole before it's, you know, <laughs> uh, or going through Scylla and Charybdis, and, and they chose the clashing rocks. And uh, Odysseus is going to be faced with the same choice, and he's going to choose a different way. So, without further ado, let me jump over here and let's get reading. Uh, I have the other translation open as well, uh, because this one is going to do the same thing it always does to us. Um, I guess it's the same translation, but it's it's a different document, because this one's going to cut off the ending, and we're going to be like, ah, you know, every single time but whatever let's uh let's read i'll put on my odysseus voice because odysseus is still the narrator and we'll go from there so we got a little bit of italics odysseus and his, odysseus and his men return to circe's island while the men sleep circe takes odysseus aside to hear about the underworld and to offer advice. Remember, Circe's a witch. She's very intelligent. Um, she gave him the advice to go see Tiresias in the first place, and now she's going to help him interpret um, Tiresias' prophecy. Then said the lady Circe, So all those trials are over. Listen with care to this now, and a god will arm your mind. Square in your ship's path are sirens, crying beauty to bewitch men, coasting by. Woe to the innocent who hears that sound. He will not see his lady nor his children in joy crowding about him home from sea. The sirens will sing his mind away on their sweet, mellow lolling. There, there are bones of dead men rotting in a pile beside them, and flayed skins shrivel around the spot. Steer wide, keep well to seaward, plug your oarsmen's ears with beeswax kneaded soft. None of the rest should hear that song, but if you wish to listen, let the men tie you in the lugger hand and foot back to the mast, lash to the mast, so you may hear those harpies' thrilling voices. Shout as you will, begging to be untied. Your crew must only twist more line around you and keep their stroke up till the singers fade. What then? <laughs> One of two courses you may take. 
and you yourself must weigh them. I shall not plan the whole action for you, but only tell you of both. There's a nice little image of what's what's to come. Um, now, the um, the sirens, of course, you know, sing this beautiful song that nobody can resist. And so this idea that their men are going to fill their ears with wax and thereby not hear the siren song is an intelligent solution that Circe offers. Uh, however, you know, Odysseus himself is sort of like this arrogant guy and the idea of being the only human being to hear the siren song and uh, live to tell the tale appeals to him. And so he's going to tie himself to the mast so he can hear the song, but thereby not have jump into the water and try and swim to the, the sirens and get killed. Um, at least that's the plan. Ahead are beetling rocks and dark blue glancing amphitrite surging roars around them, prowling rocks or drifters in gods, the gods in bliss name them and name them well. Not even birds can pass them by. So these are the rocks we're talking about. They're, they're called the clashing rocks in some translations. There's these rocks that are like, <clears throat> they keep hitting together. And if you try and sail your ship between them, your ship is going to get smashed to splinters. Even birds that try and uh, fly past them get smashed as well. A second course lies between headlands. One is a sharp mountain piercing the sky with storm cloud round the peak, dissolving never, not in the brightest summer, to show heaven's azure there, nor in the fall. No mortal man could scale it, nor so much as land there, not with twenty hands and feet, so sheer the cliffs are as if polished stone. Midway that height, a cavern full of mist opens toward Erebus, and at evening, skirting this in the lugger, great Odysseus, your master bowman shooting from the deck would come short of the cave mouth with his shaft. But that is the den of Scylla, where she yaps abominably in a newborn whelp's cry. Though she is huge and monstrous, god or man, no one could look on her in joy. Her legs, and there are twelve, are like giant tentacles, unjointed, and upon her serpent necks are borne six heads like nightmares of ferocity, with triple serra serrated rows of fangs and deep gullets of black death. Half her length she s sways her heads in the air outside her horrid cleft, hunting the sea around that promontory for dolphins dogfish or what bigger game thundering amphitrite feeds in thousands and no ship's company can claim to have passed her by without loss and grief she takes from every ship one man for every gullet so this is a, a disturbing thing there's a cliff a straight up and down cliff that nobody could climb you know like the cliffs of insanity in the princess bride or whatever and halfway up the cliff is this horrible monster living in a cave with six heads on these incredibly long necks and no matter what ship passes by um skilla the monster dips the six heads down and eats six crewmen it's a guarantee if you sail that way you're going to lose six guys at least um which you know doesn't sound great. The opposite point seems more of a tongue of land. You'd touch with a good bow shot at the narrows. A great wild fig, a shaggy mass of leaves grows on it, and Charybdis lurks below to swallow the dark sea again. Three times from dawn to dusk she spews it up and sucks it down again three times, a whirling maelstrom. If you come upon her then, the god who makes the earth tremble could not save you. No, hug the cliff of Scylla, take your ship through on the racing stroke. Better to mourn six men than lose them all, and the ship too. So he has two, two choices within this choice. Um, it's the pass. In fact, you can see it on the map if you if you look at the map. It's between Sicily and Italy. Um, there's a pass here. One side, there's a cliff, and Scylla lives in the cliff. And if you sail by that side, uh, she eats six of your crew. But if you try and stay away from Scylla and you go on the other side, um, there's Charybdis. Charybdis is this horrible whirlpool that will suck down your entire boat and smash it, and everybody will die. Now, that only happens three times a day. So what's what's the better choice? Guaranteed six men dead or try and save your whole crew, but maybe risk the whole crew. Um, and this is the choice. Um, Cersei's like, hey, you know, guarantee the six men dead. You know you get through. That's a smarter choice to make. Uh, but you can choose whichever one you want. That's sort of her, her attitude here. Uh, so her advice ran, but I faced her saying, only instruct me, goddess, if you will. How, if possible, I can pass Charybdis or fight off Scylla when she raids my crew. Swiftly, that lovely goddess answered me. 
Must you have battle in your heart forever? The bloody toil of combat, old contender, will you not yield to the immortal gods? That nightmare cannot die, being eternal evil itself, horror and pain and chaos. There is no fighting her, no power can fight her. All that avails is flight. Lose headway there, along that rock face, while you break out arms, and she'll swoop over you. I fear once more, taking one man again for every gullet. No, no. Put all your backs into it, row on, invoke blind force that bore this scourge of men to keep her from a second strike against you. Ah, if you're too slow, then skill is going to eat not just six guys, but twelve guys, right? Like, that's clearly what's going on here. So make sure you row, don't take any time to defend yourself. She's going to eat six of you no matter what, so you can't, you can't stop it. Then you will coast Thrinachia, the island where Helios's cattle graze, fine herds and flocks of goodly sheep. The herds and flocks are seven, with fifty beasts in each. No lambs are dropped or calves, and these fat cattle never die. Immortal, too, their cow herds are, their shepherds, Phaethusa and Lampicia, sweetly braided nymphs that divine Nerea bore over the overlord, to the overlord of the high noon, Helios. These nymphs, their gentle mother bred, and placed upon Thrinacia, the distant land, in care of flocks and cattle for their father. Now, this is important. Anybody who's been paying attention to this story, Tiresias said, hey, if your men eat the cattle of the sun god, da -da. and of course, we know from the invocation of the muses at the beginning that his men are going to eat the cattle of the sun god. There's no surprise here. So you'd think Odysseus would want to avoid this island, but um, Scylla says, hey, if you go through Scylla, or sorry, it's not Scylla, Circe says, if you go through Scylla and Charybdis, you're going to end up at this island one way or the other. So she gives advice. Now, give those kine, kine is an old word for cattle, um, and it's going to be used throughout here. I don't know why. I don't know why I didn't just say cattle, but whatever. Now, give those kine a wide berth. Keep your thoughts intent upon your course for home, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, beeves are like herds of cattle. It's it, The word has the same root as beef. Can you hear it? Beeves, beef. Um, Anyway, but if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Rough years then lie between you and your homecoming, alone and old, the one survivor all companions lost. Now we get a little skip, and I'm okay with this one. I don't think it's too terrible. At dawn, Odysseus and his men continue their journey. Odysseus decides to tell the men only of Circe's wanderings, warnings about the sirens, whom they will soon encounter. He is fairly sure that they can survive this peril if he keeps their spirits up. Suddenly, the wind stops. Um, the, what they skip here is that they, they um, bury um, Elpinor, who fell off the roof and died. They, they burn him, and then they build a mound, and they put his oar in it, and they do everything that he asked them to do in the land of the dead. So that's really all that we're missing here uh, from this italics, and, and hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Um, so they're approaching the island of the Sirens now. The crew were on their feet, briskly, to furl the sail and stow it. Then, each in his place, they poised the smooth oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax and bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. No long task for a burning heat came down from Helios, lord of the high noon. That's sort of foreshadowing of what's coming in the future. Going forward, I carried the wax long line and laid it thick on their ears. They tied me up then, plumb amidships, back to the mast, lashed, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to the rowing. Soon, as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens, noting our fast ship off their point, made ready, and they sang. All right, and we've got three dots here, and it skips the siren song. So it's not a huge bit, but I'm going to jump over to the other translation so that you can hear the siren song. I mean, the siren song is something that nobody has ever heard, and Homer engineered a situation in which Odysseus is going to be able to hear it, and so he wrote the siren song, and if he wrote it, why don't we read it? I don't see why not. So let me jump over to the other translation, and we'll read that. And they sang, This way, O oh, turn your bows, Greece's glory, as all the world allows, more and be merry, sweet coupled airs we sing, no lonely seafarer holds clear of entering, I don't know how the tune goes, but we'll let it go, our green mirror, pleased by each purling note, like honey twining from her throat, and my throat, who lies a-pining. Sea rovers here take joy, voyaging onward, as from our song of Troy, graybeard and rower boy goeth more learned. So they're tempting Odysseus with knowledge. Remember, he's a smart guy, and they talk about, you know, come listen to our song, and you'll be the most learned man in the world. So I think this also um, 
is is interesting from the standpoint that songs teach wisdom songs teach knowledge it goes back to the idea of the storyteller and how important stories like the odyssey uh, were to the people of ancient greece remember that there are no textbooks the, all knowledge is learned primarily through word of mouth we're finally starting to write things down and the story has been written down but through the generations um, knowledge and wisdom was gained through stories through tales told by elders and um, these sirens are offering odysseus wisdom here all feats on that green field in the long warfare dark days the bright gods willed wounds you bore there argos's old soldiery on troy's beach teeming charmed out of time we see no life on earth can be hid from our dreaming let me go check and see if um we get this bit or if they skip that too hope it's good that's that's all they skipped they just decided to skip the siren song and i don't think it's that important that you get the siren song but you can see how it appeals to odysseus their lovely voices and ardor appealing over the water made me crave to listen, and I tried to say, untie me, to the crew, jerking my brows. But they bent steady to the oars. Then Paramedes got to his feet, and Eurylochus, and passed more line about it to hold me still. So all rolled on, rode on until the sirens dropped out under the sea rim, and their singing dwindled away. Uh, so that's that's the whole episode of the sirens. But you can see how he handles it differently than, say, Orpheus does in um, the jason and the argonauts story uh where he has to out sing the sirens but odysseus now is the only man who's listened to the siren song um and knows uh what it represents now the siren song of course has become sort of an idiom or a metaphor it's got an illusion built in but for anything that drags you away from your your goals for, uh, odysseus's goal is to get home and the siren song threatens to derail him from that journey so if you if there's anything that you desire um that helps makes you lose focus we we often talk about it as the siren song of this thing and that's sort of a metaphorical way of talking about it that comes straight out of the odyssey anyway um my faithful company rested on their oars now peeling off the wax that i had laid thick on their ears then set me free but scarcely had the island faded in the blue air than i saw smoke and white water with sound of waves and tumult a sound of men heard and it terrified them Oars flew from their hands, and blades went knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way, with no oar blades to drive her through the water. Well, I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing over every oarsman, saying gently, Friends, have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome is it now than when the Cyclops penned us in his cave? What power he had! Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? Now I say, by hook or crook, this peril too shall be something that we remember. Heads up, lads. We must obey the orders as I give them. Get out the oar shafts in your hands, lay back hard on your benches, hit these breaking seas. Zeus, help us pull away before we founder. You at the tiller, listen, and take in all that I say. The rudders are your duty. Keep her out of the combers and the smoke. Steer for that headland. Watch the drift, or we fetch up in the smother and you drown us. So this sounds very clear. He's avoiding the whirlpool. The whirlpool has a geyser that shoots out in the middle of it. Uh, so it sucks in the water and then the water heats up and boosh, it shoots it out. And that happens again and again and again. And uh, so he's going to avoid Charybdis. He's going to Scylla. Now Scylla is the sure death of six members of his crew, um, which is, you know, unfortunate but i think this is this is interesting you know odysseus has to make a choice here and this is like one of those classic uh logic puzzles that people give you and you have to make a choice and there's no necessary right choice so what's better to risk everybody and maybe everybody gets through it okay and maybe you all die or to guarantee the loss of a small number and odysseus is going with the guaranteed loss of a small number um, because there's a safety in it you know what's going to happen um, but there are there are all these logic puzzles that that people give you know like if you were in the desert and uh, there were two of you and one of you got bit by a snake uh, or no both of you got bit by a snake and you only had one person's worth of anti-venom what would you do do you split it with both of you and maybe you both die or do you give it to one person and then you start factoring in the different people like one of you is you know 60 years old and the other one's 13 do you give it to the 13 year old because they have longer to live one of you's got cancer you know like you can go and you can add and and manipulate the situation uh to create varying logic puzzles in which you have to choose the lesser of two evils and odysseus has done that here um he has chosen to go by scylla but it's interesting that he has not told his crew what's coming um 
anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, that was all, and it brought them round to action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing. As they could do nothing, they would have dropped their oars again in panic to roll for, roll for cover under the decking. Cersei's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied on my cuirass, that's his, his metal shirt, and took up two heavy spears, then made my way along the foredeck, thinking to see her first. From there, the monster of the Grey Rock, harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside, veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. And all this time in travail, sobbing, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait, skillet port, and on our starboard beam, Charybdis, dire gorge of the salt sea tide. By heaven, when she vomited, all the sea was like a cauldron, seething over intense fire, with mixture suddenly heaving and rises. Um, the shot spume soared to the landside heights and fell like rain. Now, pause. Uh, this is probably a reference to Mount Etna. There's a, there's a volcano on the shore of Sicily, I believe, that was fairly active a long time ago, but not particularly. I mean, still active, but it's not as active as it was. And so Scylla, you know, is probably not. Charybdis is, you know, with the whirlpool, with the the geyser spewing out with the lava talk. It probably is a reference to this volcano. We don't know for sure, but this is this is what is guessed. Um but when she swallowed the seawater down, we saw the funnel of a maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. My men blanched against the gloom. Our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. Then Scylla made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. I happened to glance aft at the ship and oarsmen and caught sight of their arms and legs dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and bait far out, will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling through the air. So these were borne aloft in spasms toward the cliff. Now, that's another one of our heroic sort of similes or metaphors. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're fishing, you throw the line way out there and then you catch a fish and it's like, ooh, that's exactly what happened to his men, you know, like... Homer does a really good job of picking these things that are like everyday occurrences that everybody can relate to. Even now, people go fishing. You ever fish off a bridge or a dock at the ocean and you catch something and it's like boop, 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 boop as you're taking it up? That's how the poor men were uh, by, by Scylla, a fisher of men, if you will. Um, anyway, she ate them as they shrieked it there in her den, in the dire grapple reaching still for me, and deathly pity ran me through at the sight, far worst I ever suffered questing the passes of the strange sea. We rode on. The rocks were now behind. Charybdis, too, and Scylla dropped astern. And um, that's where the editors of this book chose to end it. Uh, so he sacrifices six men, but he gets past Scylla, and now they're on the other side. And then it tells you this. Odysseus tries to persuade his men to bypass Thrinacia, the island of the sun god, Helios, but they insist on landing. Driven by hunger, they ignore Odysseus' warning to not feast on Helios' cattle. This disobedience angers the sun god, who threatens to stop shining if payment is not made for the loss of his cattle. To appease Helios, Zeus sends down a thunderbolt to sink Odysseus' ship. Odysseus alone survives. He eventually drifts to Odysseus. Gigia, the island home of Calypso, who keeps him on her island for seven years. With this episode, Odysseus ends the telling of his tale to King Alcinous. All of that is true, and it's a fairly good summary of what happens, but it's not what happens in detail. And so we are going to jump over to the other um, version of this text, and we will read that uh, to get the rest of the story about um, the island and the cattle of the sun god, which is the most important moment you know aside from the cyclops this is the other moment that decides odysseus's fate and just to summarize it no nah, i'm not cool with that we rode on the rocks were now behind charybdis too and scylla dropped astern then we were coasting the noble island of the god where graze those cattle with wide brows and bounteous flocks of helios lord of noon who rides high heaven from the black ship far still at sea i heard the lowing of the cattle winding home and sheep bleeding, and heard too in my heart the words of blind Tiresias of Thebes. And Circe of Aea both forbade me the island of the world's delight, the sun. So I spoke out in the gloom to my companions. Shipmates, grieving and weary though you are, listen. I had forewarning from Tiresias and Circe too. Both told me I must shun this island of the sun, the world's delight. 
nothing but fatal trouble shall we find here. Pull away, then, and put the land astern. That strained them to the breaking point. Cursing, Eurylochus cried out in bitterness. Are you flesh and blood, Odysseus, to endure more than a man can? Do you never tire? God, look at you. Iron is what you're made of. Here we all are, half dead with weariness, falling asleep over our oars. And you say no landing, no firm island earth? where we could make a quiet supper? No, pull out to sea, you say, with night upon us. Just as before, but wandering now and lost. Sudden storms can rise at night and swamp ships without a trace. Where is your shelter if some stiff gale blows up from south or west? The winds that break up shipping every time when seamen flout the Lord God's will. I say, do as the hour demands and go ashore before black night comes down. We'll make our supper alongside and at dawn put out to sea. Now, when the rest said I to this, I saw the power of destiny devising ill. Sharply I answered, without hesitation, Eurylochus, they are with you to a man. I am alone, outmatched. Let this whole company swear me a great oath. Any herd of cattle or flock or sheep here found shall go unharmed. No one shall slaughter out of wantonness. Ram or heifer, all shall be content with, the goddess, with what the goddess Circe put aboard. They fell at once to swearing, as I ordered, and when the round of oaths had ceased, we found a half-moon bay to beach and moor the ship in, with a fresh spray nearby. All hands ashore went about skillfully getting up a meal. Then, after thirst and hunger, those besiegers were turned away, and they mourned for their companions, plucked up, plucked from the ship by Scylla and devoured, and sleep came soft upon them as they mourned. In the small hours of the third watch, when the stars that shone out to the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven, and clouds driven by Zeus shrouded land and sea in a night of storm. So, just as dawn with fingertips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave, where nymphs had chairs of rocks and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, Hold, shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold. Food and drink, the cattle here are not for our provision or we paid dearly for it. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep, Helios, and no man avoids his eye. To this my fighters nodded yes, but now we had a month of onshore gales, blowing day in, day out, south winds or south by east, as long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up and appease their craving. They would not touch the cattle, but in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, Hunger drove them to scour the wild shore, with angling hooks for fishes and sea fowl. Whatever fell into their hands and lean days wore their bellies thin. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympus, all the gods. But they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now, on the shore, Eurylochus made his insidious plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us, mortal wretches, but famine is the most pitiful, the worst end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come. We'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home, in the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. But if he flares up over his heifers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods make cause with him, why, then I say, it's better to open your lungs to a big sea once and for all than to waste a skin and bones on a lonely island. So... Yuri Locus's standpoint is like, hey, we could all starve to death here, or we could eat and die by drowning. It's death both ways, but one's a lot more pleasant than the other. Thus, Yuri Locus and it said Yuri Locus, and they murmured, I, trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now that day, tranquil cattle with broad brows were grazing near, and soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in a ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on the tall oak, having no barley meal to stew the victims. Uh, performed the prayers and ritual, knifed the kine, and flayed each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings, with strips of meat, were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first. And when the bones were burnt and tripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. Just then my slumber left me. In a rush, my eyes opened, and I went down the seaward path. 
No sooner had I caught sight of our black hull than savory odors of burnt fat eddied round me. Grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, "No, oh, Father Zeus and the gods in bliss forever, you made me sleep away this day of mischief. O oh, cruel drowsing in the evil hour! Here they sat, and a great work they contrived. Lampetia, in her long gown, meanwhile, had borne swift word to the overlord of noon. They have killed your kind. And the lord Helios burst into an angry speech amid the immortals. O oh, father Zeus and the gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus's men. So overweening, now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climbed the sky of stars, and evening when I bore westward from heaven. Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, where I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. So the sun god is like, hey, look, you can kill Odysseus's crew, and I can continue shining on the world, or you can not, and I'll go out forever, and the world will be in darkness. Your choice, Zeus. Then Zeus, who drives a storm cloud, made reply, Peace, Helios. Shine on among the gods. Shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white-hot bolt and make splinters of their ship in the wine-dark sea. There's foreshadowing for you. Zeus is like, yeah, I'll just blow up their ship with a thunderbolt. No big deal. Calypso later told me of this exchange, as she declared that Hermes had told her. Ah, this explains something. I was like, how does Odysseus know what the gods said? And wouldn't it be sort of blasphemy to put words in the gods' mouth? Well, apparently, Calypso told him because she was told by Hermes. Uh, well, when I reached the sea cave and the ship, I faced each man and had it out. But where could any remedy be found? There was no. The silken beeves of Helios, or Bevies, Bevies? I think it's Bevies, uh, of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made a queer signs appear. Cow hides began to crawl, and beef, both raw and roasted, load like kind upon the spits. That's unfortunate. Here are the signs of the gods, like the dead cows are, are like, Mrr. even the steak, like, like you cook and you're about to stab it with your fork, it's like, Mrr. I mean, that's, that's just disturbing. Can you imagine if your steak did that while you were trying to eat it? I don't think I would eat it anymore. Now, six full days, my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios' herd. And Zeus, son of Cronus, added one fine morning. All the gales had ceased, blown out with an offshore breeze. We launched again, stepping the mast and sail, to make for the open sea. Astern of us, the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere but only sea and heaven, when Zeus Cronian piled a thunderhead above the ship. While gloom spread on the ocean, we held our course but briefly. Then the squall struck. Whining from the west with gale force, breaking both forestays, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length. So the running rigging showered into the bilge. On the deck, at, on the after deck, the mast hit the steersman a slant blow, bashing the skull in, knocking him overside, as the brave soul fled his body like a diver. With crack on crack of thunder, Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she bucked in reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. Another nice simile. No more seafaring homeward for these. No sweet day of return. The god had turned his face from them. I clambered fore and aft, my hulk under a comber, split her keel from ribs, and the big timber floated free. The mast, too, broke away. A backstay floated dangling from it, stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together. Then I straddled, riding the frightful storm. So Odysseus found, like, the mast and a big piece of wood of the keel of the ship, and he tied them together with a rope that was dangling from it, made himself a raft, and now he's floating. It looks like the rest of his men drowned after the ship was hit by a thunderbolt and smashed in the storm. Nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the west wind dropped and a southeast gale came on. One more twist of the knife, that's a metaphor, taking me north again, straight to Charybdis. All that night I drifted, and in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Scylla Mountain and Charybdis Deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on it like a bat under a bough. Nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing, the root and bowl being far below, and far above my head the branches and their leaves, mast overshadowed Charybdis's pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted, and ah, how long, with what desire I waited, till at the twilight hour when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace all day between contentious men goes home to supper. The long poles at last reared from the sea. So you thought he had got away from Charybdis, but it turns out the wind blew him right back to Charybdis, and here he is, like, hanging from this tree for a whole day over the whirlpool, waiting for it to, like, whoosh back up the mast and, and uh, 
keel of his raft, and eventually it does. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled aside and rowed hard with my hands to pass Scylla. Never could I have passed her, had not the father of gods and men this time kept me from her eyes. Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea before I made shore, buoyed up by the gods upon Ojidja Isle. The dangerous nymph Calypso lives there and sings there in her beauty, and she received me, loved me. But why tell the same tale that I told last night in hall to you and your lady? Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. And that's the end. So it's it's a pretty exciting tale about what happens to his crew and how they all die. And it's all Eurolocus's fault, which is interesting because um, Homer sort of sowed seeds of that back when we first hit Calypso's Island and Eurolocus did not want to um, go back to see Calypso and sort of challenge Odysseus' authority. He's also the one that challenged Odysseus' authority with the Bag of the Winds. Uh, so he's really the only named member of the crew that causes strife and trouble and and he gets what's coming to him um one quick look at the map um odysseus and his crew sailed down here past the island of the sirens uh through scylla and charybdis and um you know made it out here uh but then he was borne back through scylla and charybdis and over floated nine days to calypso's island where he ends up um trapped for seven years without a boat without any way to get free uh and that's the end of odysseus's story we brought his narration to a close and next time we'll probably skip some of the return journey to greece and pick up um, with odysseus maybe arriving at ithaca don't forget that telemachus is on his way from pylos back to ithaca and the suitors are waiting to ambush and murder him so that's on deck two next time so we've got some exciting things coming up and then odysseus has to find a way to deal with like these uh i don't know over 50 suitors that are camped out at his house and would clearly murder his son and would probably murder him too so he's got some tricky situations yet ahead of him even if he does make it back to ithaca all right this is 37 minutes. I'm going to stop this video and let you guys get on to your classwork. Thank you.